Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Joining us on the program today is clinical psychologist from Australia. We're going to be talking about a fascinating subject that I know most of us, if not all of us, have experienced from a time or two, and we kind of pass it off as being coincidence. The word is synchronicity, and it's a way in which the universe personally communicates with each and every one of us to let us know whether or not we're on the right track. We're also going to be offered astounding case studies alongside with a lucid explanation of the brain science underlying synchronicity, including his own experiences with synchronicity, which led to advocating for positive psychiatry, as he calls it, and a new approach to treating mental illness focused on a person's strength. He is a clinical psychologist with more than 35 years of psychotherapy experience in public and private mental health settings. He is a principal psychologist at Chris Mackey and Associates, his private psychology practice in Geelong. And he's joining us here today to present his newest book, Synchronicity, How You Can Empower Your Life with the Gift of Coincidence. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Chris Mackey. Chris, thank you for joining us here on the program today. Great, Daniel, and thank you very much for having me. You bet. Now, synchronicity is something that we've all experienced, and I remember that when I was a child, I began to notice those strange coincidences, so to speak, where you would think something, and there it was right in front of you. You'd think, I sure would like to have this happen, and then it would, and you would start to think, wow, what's going on here? I'm almost starting to feel like an alchemist, so to speak. Tell us about how you began to explore this particular world and present it the way that you have. Well, Daniel, at first I was a real skeptic in terms of believing in anything that might seem seem mystical in any way. I thought that people only believed in things like that from superstition. And as a young psychologist, I went to a workshop which was about the middle. It was called the Wellness Model, and delivered by a fellow called John Travis, who helped develop that model as looking at the positive side of well-being. And um, uh, I was struck at the time that um, he was saying a lot of what I thought were outrageous things that no one seemed to dispute. And he was wearing a, a caftan, and I thought, this is very strange for a, a person from a, a, a formal medical background to be dressed like that and talking in uh, these, these ways. He had pictures of a, a seagull against clouds, and I was annoyed by that, thinking, oh, well, this looks like Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Is, is he trying to just show us some fluffy pictures rather than come up with any kind of um, you know, solid material? And he said to me at the end of... His, his workshop, he said, look, I know that you uh, might question you know, some of the things that I've said here, but you might be interested to hear that a number of scientists have turned more to a spiritual direction based on also their understanding, and that's written up in this book called The Aquarian Conspiracy by Marilyn Ferguson. Well, I was surprised by that because I thought that most scientists worth, worth their salt would be at least agnostic, if not atheist. Uh, atheistic. So I thought, well, I'll look at this book, and it took me a little while to get get into it. But when I got to a section on synchronicity, I started to experience an explosion of it, and that completely challenged my views of the world, my logical, rationalistic views of the world. And I thought this is just going beyond chance. For example, one day I saw six clients, and all of them spontaneously reported synchronistic experiences to me, and I thought. This just can't be chance. And from then on, I had many experiences of my own that, that led me to believe that, that, that there's way more to this than chance. There is another dimension to life that does relate to a spiritual or mystical dimension that we tend to ignore. Now, in your book, Synchronicity, you talk quite extensively about the, I guess, call it the universe connection, and that it's a way that as we begin to pay attention to these synchronistic experiences, that they kind of really help guide us to naturally expressing our true divine gifts. Tell us more about that. Well, one thing about synchronicity is, like as you said in the introduction, there's a way it seems to connect our inner and outer world. Like one example is thinking of someone that we haven't seen for a long period of time and that we're not likely to run into. We might be in a different city or even overseas and then running into that person soon afterward. And that, that just seems it. It seems more than chance. It, it can't be explained by logical reason how we would have thought of that person just at that time unless there was some connection 
a greater connection between our inner world and our outer world. And I think that once people become a little bit more open to that connection, often because of having had some striking experiences that challenge, if you like, their rationalistic ways of dismissing that idea, when people are more open to that experience, it seems to happen more often. And I think, as you're suggesting, it tends to happen more, on, more often when we're on track or on track in our lives or living according to our destiny. Now, what's really interesting about synchronicity is it begins to occur, uh, as you talk about in your book, uh, you can become to a point where you start to feel sort of personally important or super special, so to speak. And, and I kind of laughed yeah. about that because you tend to see those gurus out there. You know, okay, I've arrived, so you need to be paying attention to what I need to tell you sort of a thing. And it's like, you know, that's also an easy way that you can get bumped off the course a little bit too, isn't it? Yes, that's a very good way of putting it. And I think it's to do with stages of personality development when we get to earlier stages of enlightenment. And in psychology, people don't talk much about enlightenment. We talk about our personality developing from maybe being very self-interested to then conforming more, to then being a bit more autonomous or independent. And then we develop to a stage of being more integrated with other people, pursuing our own interests, but getting on with other people and considering theirs. And that tends to be where people think that personality development stops. But you know, probably from the uh, dawn of civilization in many cultures, many cultures realize that there's personal development that goes beyond that to do with different stages of enlightenment. And a further stage is recognizing that there's another dimension in life. If you like a spiritual, I sometimes even refer to it as a mystical dimension where there are life forces beyond what meets the eye, so to speak. I'm not particularly religious, so I don't think of that in terms of God. That's probably partly what people are referring to when they um, talk about um, uh, God. But even not being particularly religious, we can sense that there's another dimension. And people often first encounter that other dimension through some kind of psychic or mystical experience, uh, uh, an experience beyond the norm where people might feel that they have an uncommon level of deeper intuition. And because I think people are actually starting to tap into a deeper level of intuition. And many people like Maslow or William James and uh, Carl Jung and other famous psychologists and psychiatrists have said over the last you know, 100 years or so, there are different mistakes that people can make when they encounter these mystical uh, psychic or deep intuitive experiences, these uh, experiences related to enlightenment, we can shy away from it because we can be fearful of it and think, well, look, look, we don't have any way of making sense of this. We're fearful of the unknown. We can shy away from it and then shut it down. But the other way that we can respond to it, which would also be a mistake, it's something called psychic inflation. It's the idea of thinking, oh, I'm special. You know, I've been picked out somehow by the universe to have this you know, rare and maybe unique knowledge. And so there must be something about me that's sort of you know, special or different from other people. And part of my reason in writing the book on synchronicity is to help realize, first of all, that many other people have these kinds of experiences. As, as a matter of fact, I think it's a natural part of further personality development to tap into this further dimension in life and to tap into our deeper intuition. And I'm encouraging people to notice that, listen to that, pay attention, because it helps bring out our fuller potential. But I'm also encouraging people to you know, watch out for thinking this means you're special in any way. Actually, a whole lot of people have experiences like this. They might not talk about it, because it might not be fashionable, especially in scientific circles or mental health circles or whatever. People are nervous about saying anything like this lest they be thought that they've you know, gone wacky or lost their professional credibility. But I'm saying this is actually normal and, and actually it's a very positive thing for people to have these experiences. But don't get carried away with yourself or think you're overly special. And I, I started to feel, fall into that trap myself at different times. And I write about that. You know, there's a risk of what we call psychic inflation, and it's important to stay grounded. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, that's one of the things I think is important about noticing psychic and mystical phenomena. 
Now, it's really interesting because in your book you talk about the difference between Carl Jung and, uh, and of course, um, uh, now see now his name just eluded me here, the other prominent psychologist, and that Carl Jung really deeply explored uh, synchronicity, especially in the realm of uh, dream work, that this is one of the ways that you can be communicated through, is that through dreams that you can be given symbols or perhaps ideas. Uh, Sigmund Freud was, of course, the other psychologist I was talking about yeah. here, and but the, he didn't feel uh, so much of that. Uh, Freud kind of was, well, no, I'm not so sure about this. And, uh, and it was really interesting because as Jung began to explore this and share what he was coming up with in the world, you know, it seems between the two, he was more on track about how we could communicate and come to embrace this wonderful phenomenon to be able to work with this to really, again, understand what we're here to do, what our special purpose is, and how to go about continuing that and strengthening that particular uh, thing that we have within us. Yes, I think that's a very interesting contrast between Freud and Jung as well, and, um, and both very brilliant men. But in time, Freud came to emphasize that a whole lot of people's uh, experience, unconscious experience, dreamlike experience, uh, related to sexuality. He had a marked focus on sexuality, so he talked about the Oedipal complex and, and related that to sexuality and, 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 and sexual experience and impulses in different ways. Whereas Carl Jung uh, interpreted much of unconscious experience in terms of spirituality, and, uh, and that include notions of, uh, of destiny. And so one of the differences is, is Freud thought that unconscious experience, including what influenced our dreams, would come from repressed or suppressed material, so uh, different kinds of thoughts or feelings or impulses or reactions that people might um, otherwise have in, in waking life would be suppressed in different ways and come out in our dreams to show, if you like, a, a, an unrecognized um, uh, part of ourselves. But Jung believed that, this, uh, that, that part of what influenced our unconscious, he, he included uh, some of those notions of Freud, that we can repress or suppress material from our uh, uh, consciousness or things that aren't acceptable to us in impulses or thoughts, we can sort of try and hide away from ourselves and they come out in what Jung described as our shadow. So our darker side or uh, side of ourselves that we don't accept very well. But Jung also said that our dreams are another example of how the unconscious communicates with us and it gives us information about things that, as he put it, by logic, we could not possibly know. And that comes up, I find, when people have dreams about something that then later on is confirmed and the person can't possibly have known of that information like I've known of people who've had dreams that say uh, yeah go and look here and you'll find something for example one female client that I was seeing uh, she was in a relationship where she had reason to wonder whether her partner was being trustworthy and she had this message come to her in a dream saying look on top of this uh, either laundry or bathroom cupboard, look up at the top of this cupboard and you will find some information that will you know, uh, uh, tell you something important. So she went and she had to climb up and, and uh, I think there was a bundle of clothes or things like that on top of this uh, cupboard and she rummaged around with it and she found a docket that was a, a docket for, uh, it was a hotel receipt and from that, she knew that her partner had been conducting an affair where he had stayed in this um, hotel with someone else. She confronted him with this information that he could no longer deny that he had an affair. Now, the question is, how would she possibly know to look in that particular spot? And what would lead her to keep on uh, you know, looking when she just saw you know, like a, a pile of you know, clothes um, uh, jumbled there? Uh, that, that is an example, I believe, of the unconscious informing us of, of things that, that we can't um, have known of by other rational means. That, 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 that uh, particular lady had many other experiences of what we could call psychic phenomena, which helped lead her very well um, in, into her future, including a dream of, um, of, of 
she thought that she would get important information from ancestors. She had actually a vision. This was a waking vision, or, uh, actually, rather than a dream, a waking vision of, an, of a, uh, someone who was an old world kind of figure who gave us some information that she followed through and it was very helpful for her. She was, um, uh, she learned that uh, she was doing a study of her family tree, and and she hadn't been able to find any information about her ancestors, which she thought would give her encouragement and strength. She'd given up after many hours of looking, but that night before going to bed, she encountered this vision of an old bent over old man in hobnail boots and funny clothes, and he said to her. You know, keep on looking. In the morning, you'll find the information you require. So she was going to give up. But the next morning, she spent half an hour on the computer looking up a family tree before she found a completely unknown strand of her family who were very accomplished in the community and academia. And even though she came from uh, a background that was relatively impoverished with very little education, that connection with a, 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 a much more resourceful history gave her confidence to go back to university, which she did, and then she thrived upon. And without that kind of vision, she might not have kept on pursuing that path. And earlier on, without that dream, she might not have uh, been in a position to confront her then boyfriend about what was happening, the negative things happening in their relationship. So they're just examples of how a person might practically draw on particular experience that helps shape a better future for themselves. Now, as I was talking about Carl Jung and, of course, uh, Sigmund Freud, what's really interesting is that it seemed more people seem to be of the Sigmund Freud model, for instance, when I go back to the scientific paradigm of how long we were stuck in the Newtonian physics realm for instance, yeah. of, of phenomena, until, of course, Einstein came along and pretty much shattered a lot of those theories. But what was fascinating is how long we stayed in that realm of belief. And you say that mainstream psychology needs to do more to, uh, to acknowledge a spiritual dimension in people's life, which would also include a greater acknowledgement of mystical-sounding or paranormal experiences. As I was reading in the book, it seems this is an area that psychologists kind of will brush off, well, you know, that's just, you know, kind of a crazy coincidence. But other than that, just don't focus too much meaning on your experience. What is it about them that they're so slow to come around with this? Well, I think that science tends to be very conservative by nature, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. We want lots of information to um, uh, back other information up before we accept something as... as um, as uh, demonstrated, as, as, as factual, and then hopefully we act on that. But that means it's a somewhat conservative uh, kind of approach. But the thing is, scientists themselves are also um, human beings who want to stick with the herd, who want to stick with the flock. It's difficult to go outside of that. And that leads people to be very conservative. And that means that people also tend to ignore information that, that counters their view, which, which is, is, is like the, the herd mentality view. And one of the things that struck me is when I looked at the work of the quantum physicists, it was quite striking how many of the early fathers of quantum physics, as a result of their learning, went in a much more mystical direction. People like Schrodinger and others tended to go in a much more mystical direction. And that was partly based on their findings from, uh, fr from physics, which suggested that the basis of the world, of the physical world, is in fact consciousness. And then that means that we need to pay attention to consciousness. And they also um, learned other things, like the notion of time being an illusion and notions that potentially time could travel backwards as well as forwards the notion of there being one unitary consciousness where everything is connected to everything else. And this started to sound like, well, religion in some ways. And so a number, number of them started to look up things like the Danta philosophy and realised that a lot of uh, uh, spiritual principles that have been written about for like a thousand years, uh, almost 2,000 years or more, tied in with their findings of physics. So a lot of the early scientists did change their 
personal world views and believe that uh, a lot of experiencing physics fits um, with uh, mystical experience in, in, in some ways. For example, there's the principle of entanglement. Entanglement in physics means that there are two particles that can come in contact with each other, and then if they're separated by great distances, they're still connected instantaneously, even though one of them might be from one side of the world to the other, or literally from one side of the universe to the other. They're tangled. They fun in fun they're entangled as though they're part of one system or one thing. And Einstein said, that can't be true. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. If you have two particles separated from one side of the world to the other, there's no such thing. There could be no such thing as spooky action at a distance that connects these things. And it's turned out from experiments in the 70s and 80s, they've confirmed that entanglement exists. So in my view, if physical objects can be connected instantaneously at a distance, then why not people's consciousness? Why can't it be that someone thinks of ringing someone, it might be an identical twin sister at, uh, who lives on the other side of the world, and just before they ring their sister, their sister rings them. And this happens again and again and again. And a number of people describe that kind of experience which is termed propinquity, a sense of nearness. We think of someone and then we run into them straight afterwards. We think of ringing someone and then they ring us. That suggests that we're connected in some way. Well, rather than this just being a wacky scientific, a wacky mystical superstitious idea, I think that fits with the notion of there being one consciousness that underlies all of physical life, as well as um, as well as our, our psychological life, in a sense. That we've learned to see ourselves as little isolated blocks or whatever that are just um, uh, we're all separated like separate um, units, rather than there being this. Um, uh, a collective unconscious that Carl Jung described that connects us all. And so uh, I think that's one thing that's in, important for um, uh, scientists and psychologists to notice, and it, it is changing dramatically. I went to a conference a couple of years ago when a very influential mainstream psychologist called Donald Meikenbaum, who is very famous for his work in helping bring more acknowledgement of cognition into psychology. So we talk about cognitive behavioural therapy these days, which is probably the most prominent form of psychological therapy practised around the world. Well, it used to mainly be behaviour therapy, and people would ignore thinking or cognition, thinking that that wasn't very scientific to look at that. It was just too vague and fluffy, and we should just focus on behaviour because that's what we can scientifically observe. And Mike and Baum came, came along along with others and said, we can't ignore cognition, we can't ignore thinking. This is an important part of people's psychological experience, an important part of their lives. Now, just from a couple of years ago or a few years ago, Mike and Baum has started to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, us psychologists and others, we are tending to ignore spiritual experience just as much as we used to ignore cognitive experience. A spiritual dimension to life is very important to many people. So regardless of whether you're religious or not, or agnostic or atheist or not or whatever, we need to consider the importance of a spiritual dimension in people's lives, at, at least consider the importance of it to them. And so I think that now that mainstream psychologists are starting to acknowledge this issue, we'll see a dramatic shift. And actually one other thing I'd like to mention that goes back to Jung and Freud. What's One thing that struck me, a nice little bit of synchronicity, is when my book came out in Australia and I had a, a, a public book launch on the 12th of September last year, it came a day after uh, a, a movie came out. It had a world premiere for the movie called Time is Art, Synchronicity in the Collective Dream. And that came out on the 11th of September around the world. It was chosen uh, that date because the 11th of September relates to... Um, uh, 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 relates to um, uh, numbers on a, a digital clock, the, the, the 11s on a, a digital um, uh, uh, clock. Um, people often see 11, 11, and, and so uh, that in repeated numbers 11, and so that date was chosen. Now, I think it's interesting that 100 years after Carl Jung, here's a new film and here's a new book that come out within a day each other, actually because 
Australia's a day ahead than the states. Basically, they came out within hours of each other. I think that shows that Carl Jung's notions about synchronicity that he was developing from about 100 years ago are both timeless and timely. It's very timely for us to be talking about something like this because I think the world is going through a period of transformation. I know that came up in an interview that you had early, um, uh, at the start of this year with a, a lady who's a psychic and she's talking about a theme of this year being a theme of transformation. Well, I believe the world is going through a process of transformation that will be happening in psychology as well. And one of the main ways that will be happening is a greater acknowledge of a, acknowledgement of a spiritual or mystical dimension to life and Jung will be seen as a very significant leader in that, even though he's been dead for 50 years. I wouldn't mind sharing with the listeners as well as with you a synchronistic experience that led me to where I am today doing, uh, it's now a podcast, but it used to be a mainstream radio show. Um, but Thanks, before, Daniel. What's that? Great, I'm looking forward to hearing this. Okay, but first of all, what I'd like you to do, if you could, is quickly kind of give people an idea, what is the difference between a coincidence and synchronicity? Okay, now, I think it's partly to do with the uh, striking nature of the coincidence. So when it boils down to it, um, synchronicity is coincidence that is more than just coincidence. It's not just mere coincidence because it is so uncanny or improbable and it's meaningful. Now, it can include little more minor examples of synchronicity if they occur in a, you know, uh, in a run, if you like, or whatever. So it's not just one isolated incident, but you put them together in their totality and you think, wow, this really is uncanny. This is so improbable when you look at them all together and also it has a meaningful theme. So I'll give one example of the, the best and worst experiences in my life I'd already been convinced of synchronicity. I kept on coming across the number of six again and again and again, especially when uh, in the relation of my new relationship with my girlfriend and that developing, we subsequently became married. Inadvertently, we'd become engaged at 6 p.m. on the 6th of June. So again, these repeated sixes. And, and, and I hadn't planned that. I'd actually thought we'd get engaged the earlier the previous day. Now, six years later, the worst experience in my life, I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital with severe depression. And part of the theme of the book is how we can manage with, with uh, mental health problems and overcome them uh, in different ways. I haven't been depressed for 25 years after I recovered from that. But I was admitted to hospital at 6 p.m. on the 6th of June. Now, when I wrote the book, when I was researching it, I learned that Jung died on the afternoon of 6th of June. These things, I think, it just goes way more than just coincidence. It just seems too precise, too uncanny, too meaningful. But ultimately, the perception of synchronicity is largely a subjective one. But I find that when I have an open mind and I listen to people's experience of what they consider to be synchronicity, I would find it very difficult to dismiss many of people's stories as being mere chance or coincidence. I think I'd have to be very gullible to believe that could have just happened by chance. You know, and it's interesting because as I was reading in your book about synchronicity, you reminded me of a guest that we had on the show who is an expert at waking dreams and even sleeping dreams and how you work with the interpretation. And, and his, his approach was probably the most unique and, to me, most reasonable, spot-on way that you go about <clears throat> excuse me, understanding the dreams and the dream messages. Uh, and he says... Uh, you know you're having a waking dream. Let's just call the waking dreams first of all. Uh, you know that's when you're not asleep. Obviously, he says for it to be to, to be a waking dream, it has to have one of the elements is it has to shock you. And and it was interesting in reading your book Synchronicity because you were sort of saying the same thing about synchronicity that it can be a coincidence if it happens to go. Oh, that's kind of cool. But it's a different story when it's synchronicity because it's just too far out there to believe, whoops, I accidentally bumped into this. It really screams yes. at you. For instance, you shared a story about a young man, I believe his name was Eric, who was on the verge of committing suicide. And as yes. you described the story there, he had the pistol to his mouth, but he chipped his tooth, noticed a raven outside his window who basically kamikazed into the window and died. 
And, yeah. you know, that would be a shocking, I mean, a raven of all things, you know, crashing into a window. Yeah. This is something a raven just doesn't do, you know. And that that yeah. kind of led him to the epiphany, well, maybe my life is worth living, you know, sort of a thing, since this bird is basically messaging me, you know, that this isn't the way you really want to go. And so you realize that synchronistic experiences, they, you know, they're just, they're wonderful things, and they can't just be dismissed as psychotic experiences. And so here's where I'll share my experience, if that's okay with you. Sure. I have always wanted to work in radio since I was a little kid. And originally what I wanted to do was spend records as a disc jockey. So anyway, life goes on, and you grow up, and you kind of go off in different directions, and I never really totally pursued it what any way, shape, or form. And it wasn't until I was in my, I guess, mid-30s, I had gotten myself into a relationship that I thought was the relationship. After about a month and a half, two months, it finally fizzled out and left me heartbroken. So there I was, kind of sulking in my own misery, but what I was noticing was what was coming up for me was this idea of worthiness. Okay, It really wasn't about losing her in the relationship. It was about how I felt about myself. So what was interesting, I thought, one of the ways that would make me feel better is that I would go ahead and go into a Toastmasters meeting because I was usually pretty good about public speaking. And I decided to find a group that I thought was the most intelligent, highly motivated, got it going on in their lives kind of a group that if I could, you know, basically uh, do my thing there, then I would feel worthy. (laughs) Yeah. Now, here's the interesting thing. It was also right around the time that I was thinking to myself, you know, I really should think about pursuing this radio thing that I've always wanted to do. And so I go to this first Toastmasters meeting, and I haven't been back to it since. But at that meeting, this guy stood up and he talked about how he wanted to be the world's greatest radio interviewer. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I connected with him after the meeting, and I said, so where do you do radio interviewing at? He says, as a matter of fact, I do it at a local... PBS affiliate, known as Oregon Public Broadcasting, which is part of the PBS network. He says, go on there and talk to this guy and see about maybe volunteering. So I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that. So I did. Now, what was interesting is he says, well, what do you really want to do here? And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to do radio. And he says, great, I've got this guest coming in at this time. Here's the book. you got a couple of hours. Why don't you go ahead and do this interview? And I thought, okay, well, I never thought about interviewing people on the radio again. Like I said, I wanted to just spin records. So anyway, it was about two or three days later, I noticed that on the interviewing schedule, there was a particular guest that I had a lot of, I guess, respect for, who was on a mainstream show being interviewed for her book called Life is a Game. If Life is a Game, These are the Rules. And I had a lot of respect for her because that book actually sort of also nurtured me through this this heartbreak, if you understand what I mean there. Yeah. So yeah. I'm looking at this list, and I go and I talk to him, and I said, is this person showing up in studio? And he says, well, yeah. And I said, would it be okay if I interviewed her? He says, no problem. Here's the book. She's all yours. And I couldn't believe it, <laughs> you know, that I was actually uh, going to be amazing. sitting in front of this person, okay? So knowing uh, that, that same day that I scheduled that to be on my docket, so to speak, I'm on my way home to go and pick my children up from school. It was just a beautiful day, and I was listening to M. Scott Peck's uh, The Road Less Traveled and Beyond book on tape. So as I'm driving along, I'm kind of in this bliss just thinking about how all this is coming together and it, better than I had ever expected. And the next thing I know, I kind of looked up, and there happened to be a blue van in front of me, and I swear this is what I read on the license plate. And yeah. only ways that you can have on the license plate, God bless you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, wonderful. And it just brought a tear to my eye because you got to look at this chain of events and you can't just pass that off as those are just lucky coincidences. <laughs> I think uh, I, I think was being so- told you finally got on track, God bless you, now let's go to work and have some fun. <laughs> that, that's absolutely delightful and your story tells... Uh, I think that the the core themes behind synchronicity, I think that we're much more likely to experience synchronicity when we're on track in our lives or following our rightful destiny. And that's why I think of synchronistic experiences as ticks from the universe. It's that tick or affirmation from the universe, yes, you're on the right track. 
and that experience you just described and, and, um, and the radio program and meeting someone you had a connection with, interviewing them, uh, the, then the God bless you, it's a feeling of affirmation. And I also think sometimes synchronicity comes in the form of, uh, to use a sporting analogy, a free kick from the universe. You got a free kick. You, know, you went to Toastmasters, it directs you to this, this radio interview. The person that you uh, have an opportunity to interview has a particular significance or meaning to you and then you're off and away. So these synchronistic experiences have nudged you towards your destiny. And the Greeks used to talk about our destiny in terms of daemon. Our Romans referred to destiny in terms of genius, not meaning you're the most brilliantly intelligent person, but more in terms of um, destiny. So daemon or, or, um, uh, or, or genius or um, uh, Christians might refer to a guardian angel. There are lots of different terms that many cultures have that relate to the term destiny. And I think that this leads to a notion that my grandmother used to talk about. She said, life is like a jigsaw puzzle. The longer you live, the more you see the jigsaw pieces, jigsaw puzzle pieces fall into place. But I think that we can help things fall into place in a more optimal way if we're open to those, whether we call them messages from the universe or whatever, which also means tapping into our deep intuition because you are tapping into things within yourself that help lead you to the toast master's um, meeting and then a number of things unfolded that you couldn't possibly have manufactured those um, opportunities for yourself and you ended up getting a couple of very significant free kicks from the universe then you're off and away so your, your story is a delightful example of I think the core themes about synchronicity and how helpful it can be in our lives you know and to you know add a final note to that particular story what was fascinating about that starting experience in radio was I had always found myself fascinated with people that you wouldn't know about. You know, one day you might be standing next to a guy and you're just talking with him and you discover he used to be an engineer for NASA, you know, on the Apollo space program. <laughs> Here you're in the supermarket yeah. talking with this guy at the produce section. Like, So I found people fascinating, and so in doing so, during those times as I would talk with them, I noticed personally, that I had this uncanny way of pulling the best out of them, getting them excited about talking about themselves, I never would have thought about doing radio as we're doing it here today, where I'm interviewing guests such as yourself about fascinating subjects, you know, and, and the things that I've been able to learn from people, especially like yourself, it's like, I'll go through a week at times, and I'll just be forever transformed with some of the newest things that I've learned from people like yourself. And what was fascinating about this first radio experience in the station that I went to is I was talking with all the top people from around the world that were on the media circuits, you know, people that you would see in mainstream major news outlets, things like that. And I thought, how did I land in a gig like this? I thought you had to go through all these other steps. And here I was just right there in the middle of it. And what made it even better was that it started showing me, yes, you are not only worthy, you're more than worthy because – how excited guests <clears throat> excuse me, were about being on the program, feeling like their time was well spent. And, you know, again, as I was saying, you can't just strike that up as coincidence because there were too many even underlying subtle, uh, call them, uh, wishes, if you will, that were just appearing. And, and, and it all started from what could be considered a bad synchronistic experience, which was the heartbreak. <laughs> and that sometimes happens too, doesn't it, where synchronicity happens in a way where it bumps you kind of hard. Hey, dude, you're going in the wrong direction, and I need you to wake up. <laughs> Does that happen that uh, way as well? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely, and I think uh, one example of how synchronicity happens more often when you're on the right track, the only synchronicity that I particularly experienced around um, the time when I was very depressed and admitted to hospital is more in retrospect realising that it was 6pm on the 6th of June. And so that led me to think, hey, wait a minute, rather than just being this terrible experience of being depressed and off work for six months and all the rest of it, maybe this has got some significance and worthwhile significance in my life and I would say a lot of the most valuable things that I've learned as a psychologist in my you know, 35 years experience is what I learned from having been 
a, a, a patient hospitalised for depression, and I saw a lot of things that were, and experienced a lot of things that were very negative about the field of psychiatry, which is partly how I thought it needed to change. And um, and, and so, uh, just in terms of your story and psychiatry and, and brain science, I'd like to um, make this point. When you talk about y y your work now and you're interviewing people and you have connections and you seem to uh, at times have a, uh, I think at times it sounds like you have a mindset which likely draws fascinating people to you in a certain way as well. When there's a harmony or balance in life, sometimes you can sort of attract a certain kind of um, energy or experience that tends to happen m more often. But I imagine that from the experiences you described earlier, you will have a great sense of conviction about your work. And I think part of that will be based on also when people have synchronistic experiences, I think it likely leads to some kind of release of dopamine in our brain. And we often think of dopamine in terms of pleasure, but it also relates to learning and motivation. When, when an experience shocks you, like you mentioned, like a waking dream or synchronicity, when that really shocks us and draws our attention and leads us to be very focused and engaged on what's happening, that's going to have an impact on our brain chemistry. And one of the main things that's likely to happen is some release of dopamine. And I think that the release of dopamine around experiences that seem to be a right fit for us, an optimal direction for us or whatever, will really, uh, again, bolster our sense of motivation, direction, conviction. So I imagine that you could have 100 people walk up to you and say, oh, look, you know, you're not doing things the right way. Your radio program is, is, is rubbish. You should be doing something else. And it'll be um, water off a duck's back because there's much, something much deeper driving you. And I think that's a very healthy and worthwhile thing. It's also important to have a balance in life and you mentioned having a bit of fun with things too and after your experience you mentioned driving back and reconnecting with your children that's delightfully grounded and all the rest of it. But I think it does help to have a sense of conviction where we're heading. And the example that you mentioned where a fellow was about to take his life and a raven smashed into the window, that was about two years ago. This fellow had a very, very severe ice addiction and throughout his entire adult life, about 20 years, he'd had a severe alcohol addiction. This fellow is again free of addictions two years later. He um, uh, became married, his father to child, he's flourishing at work. Now, again, a lot of this turned around because of the incidents where he's about to take his life and then he felt this blackbird, a raven, sacrificed itself for him. It had this marked, uh, it, it, it shocked him in the most extreme way. He felt, I'm meant to live. He turned his life around and he, he's achieved a positive outcome that even very few people have achieved from the rehabilitation program that he, that he went to overseas. And part of it is this sense of conviction. And so I think that psychiatry needs to take into account how certain experiences can change our brain chemistry in a positive way. And when I talk about the need for positive psychiatry over and above positive psychology, positive psychology is a very helpful and flourishing field over the last 15 years that says don't just look at, um, say, clinical psychology or mental health psychology as looking at all the problems that we might have in our personality. Look at all the, also the best in ourselves and how we can bring out the best in ourselves. But positive psychology often draws short of emphasising spirituality because of the fear of appearing unscientific. So not meant to talk about that so much. In private, people might talk about that, but wary of talking about that at conferences or in public, but that's changing now, fortunately. But um, also, psychiatry tends to focus very much on the negative. It talks about um, people having mental health problems or depression because they've got some genetic defect and it leads to a biochemical imbalance and they need drugs to improve that. And I'll mention in our, in our practice at Chris Mackey and Associates, we've got research on over 600 adults with major depressive disorders. The ones that we treat without medication have recovered just as well and just as quickly as the people who've concurrently been treated with medication. So psychiatry needs to deal with findings that don't make sense by the usual kind of um, explanations. But also psychiatry tends to be pessimistic. It tends to, um, uh, in focusing on, on uh, the negative, it also over-focuses on 
the need for drugs or uh, that aspect and tends to completely ignore uh, uh, mystical, spiritual or psychic experience. And that means that many people who have legitimate enlightenment experiences, sometimes called satori, can be misjudged as being psychotic. And actually when I had some of the most striking enlightened experiences around 10 years ago, around the time that my mother died, I still look at that as one of the most productive and uh, times in my life where I was functioning extremely well in many ways. But um, a, a number of people close to me thought I was psychotic. Many didn't, including psychologists who worked closely with me in my work setting and a number of other friends who knew me well and knew of my prior interest in synchronicity, but especially where people had some kind of medical training. They are much likely to misinterpret what I was experiencing as psychotic. And when I had no longer any need to draw on a particular mindset, drawing on mystical experience to help me deal with problems, I was able to change that process within a couple of days and get back very much to my normal self without any medication or whatever. And a number of my uh, reactions or behavior at the time overlapped with uh, a hypomanic condition, meaning that I didn't uh, need as much sleep, I could think much quicker, I had high levels of energy. I deliberately entered a state which was I call a hypomanic-like state. It looked similar to that on the surface, but deep down what was going on was different. And a number of people who especially had medical training or influenced by that area, I believe mistook um, my presentation for thinking, oh, Chris is going nuts, he's going psychotic, he's, he's very manic, even though I could explain the purpose why I was trying to get by with less sleep, think quicker, have more energy, and have uh, a lot of optimism about the way I, was, uh, way I was going. I was able to change that process in two days, as I predicted, and yet, None of those people who said to me, look, Chris, you're psychotic, said, look, Chris, how come you've been able to change everything in two days? How come you're so back to normal or whatever? They just dismissed it. It was just off their radar. They just didn't notice it. It was no longer newsworthy. So what, what strikes me is people notice what fits with their worldview and completely ignore or dismiss what doesn't fit with their worldview. And the whole field of psychiatry does not allow for spiritual or mystical experience in its worldview, so it just dismisses it. And it discredits people who express themselves in a way that otherwise might be seen as a mystical or spiritual deeper understanding. Now what that means is many people who might be having legitimate mystical experiences known as Satori in some cultures or Samadhi or other terms in many other cultures, many of those people can be diagnosed as psychotic. And it's been shown that if those people end up in hospital, and are misdiagnosed as psychotic early on, they can have very, very poor outcomes. And the whole field of psychiatry needs to become aware of that to no longer make that mistake. But secondly, the field of psychiatry should look at also the positive side of our brain chemistry. And if we're looking to bring about our fullest potential as human beings, which Lord knows the world needs that these days, we need to differentiate ourselves and, and, and uh, follow our um, uh, uh, optimal paths to help the many problems that the world has, psychiatry as well as psychology needs to consider how we can bring out the best in ourselves and I believe one way of doing that is also tapping into our deeper intuition, not just ignoring it, tapping into our deeper intuition and that I think can enhance our brain chemistry in a positive way including I believe those experiences that you described will have led to releases of dopamine at particular times that would have helped you with your conviction of following your path, motivated you, given you energy, given you satisfaction and enjoyment. Um, uh, uh, positive psychology doesn't talk so much about this spiritual dimension or how you know, uh, brain chemistry might be involved as much. It's starting to. I think, why don't we look at this? Many people have these kinds of experiences. Why don't we try to understand what's going on with those positive experiences so people at least have permission to pursue that themselves rather than be discredited for saying that that's what they think is what's going on. Now, it's really fascinating. There's a story I'd like to share uh, real quickly here that actually has to do with the rock uh, rocker uh, Tom Petty of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. All There's right. a wonderful documentary. It's very first person. You know, it's mostly him sharing his story. 
And there's a segment in the documentary, and I, and I don't know if I'm quoting it exactly, but it's pretty close, Strange Coincidences, okay? And so he was talking about how he was at a point in his career, and this was back in the 1980s, where he felt like he wanted to kind of branch out and do more collaboration. One of the guys that he had a lot of reverent respect for happened to be the ex-Beatle George Harrison, okay? And so there he was, he was thinking, you know, how would I go about connecting with this guy? And he says, I just happened to walk into a hotel in the lobby, and coming out of the elevator happened to be George Harrison. He says, hey, dude, I was just thinking about how am I going to connect with you, and here you are, okay? So that started that. And then the next thing was collaborating with another gentleman by the name of Ray Orbison. And then there were one or two more, and that's what came together as, um, I'm trying to think of the, the Traveling Wilburys, okay? And so yeah. they ended up producing an album. But then after the fact, he also collaborated and helped out Ray Orbison by writing a song that became a top ten hit. And Roy Orbison's career had been out of the mainstream for, you know, for years. And he yeah. says, you know, it was really the coolest thing because Roy had called me and he says, hey, did you notice that, that song that we, that we wrote, you know, uh, is in the top ten? Isn't that neat? And he says, he just sounded so jazz, just like a little kid at Christmas. He says, the most unfortunate thing happened was a week later, Roy Orbison died. And he began ah. to feel as though somehow everything came together so he could have that last ride into the sunset. And he felt so good that these things came together as easily and quickly as they did, perhaps so that he could have that shining moment before his death. And I thought, wow, see, everybody experiences this. And then you're talking about how you use synchronicity in your practice to create positive psychology and positive change. So my question, you know, for this whole synchronicity thing for our listeners is, when we get on the track and we're noticing that we're having synchronistic experiences, what can we do where we can stay on that course so it happens more often? I think one of the main things, oh, can I just mention too, I think you've just told that delightful story about the traveling Wilburys and Tom Petty's experience. It, it shows the expression, the universe provides. Absolutely. And I think that especially <laughs> if we're in a certain mindset and a certain outlook and, and a certain positive energy about us, that's more likely. I just as an aside, I think Bob Dylan was another one involved in the traveling Wilburys, a wonderful combination. And you've described now how it came together. A lot of uh, Tom Petty's energy helped uh, with that. But what can people do about synchronicity? Well, I think the main thing is be open. Be open to our experience and what might what it might tell us. Just be open to noticing any little coincidences that come up or anything that strikes our attention. And also be open to our intuition and our deeper intuition. And especially if we find that something that happens in our outside world is really resonating with, with, um, with our uh, uh, worldview at the time or, or some interest that we have or whatever, just pay attention to these connections between our inner and outer experience and allowing our intuition to operate. And then I use the term, uh, notice what you notice. And so that, that, comes, that term actually comes from the beat poet, Allen Ginsberg. He used to say, notice what you notice. And we can notice these little resonances or things that stand out or an inkling uh, to follow. So you had this inkling to meet with certain people and you went to Toastmasters. You're actually paying attention to your deeper experience, even though you're in pain at the time, and you're responding to something, and you're picking up on the different opportunities that, that were there, and you're noticing um, uh, 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 things that, 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 that came up, including certainly uh, you see that there's a guest in the radio um, program that, that, that you, you particularly related to. You're going to, notice, um, you're going to notice things that hit you over the head as a coincidence, but also be open to some of the more minor things that resonate. And then just allow different, uh, allow the meaning to bubble up over time. We don't have to force ourselves to try and interpret what it means, but just be open to the prospect, especially if we have a run of synchronicity, a number of experiences that seem to relate to a particular theme, or it's particularly strong. So I think in Tom Petty's experience, he thinks of collaboration, and he comes across George Harrison, and then his connection with, with Roy Orbison, it's, it, it, it's really affirming for him, this is the right thing to do, not just to collaborate with people, but 
you know, collaborate with some of the greatest musicians in the world and not have any hesitation about that, think that's the, that's the right thing to do. So then I think there's that notion of sometimes acting on our intuition. And if we see something as an opportunity, then uh, th this is actually where the term kairos comes in. The term kairos relates to acting uh, in the right time, acting in a timely way. And that's where there was a, uh, an expression used by the writer Carlos Castaneda. He talks about the difference between a warrior and an ordinary mortal is an warrior is always ready looking out for their cubic centimetre of chance, looking ready to strike. Now, the thing is, uh, in, that, in your example, Tom Petty would have been very ready to make the most of that contact with George Harrison. If he hadn't gone through that experience at first, he might have just nodded hello and walked past or something like that, but he was very ready to make the most of that experience. And for George Harrison, it would have been a much more salient experience because of uh, uh, the way that Tom Petty ap ap approached him and recognising, hey, this is, seems more than just, just um, uh, coincidence. So to be open to our deeper intuition, to be open to noticing uh, uh, coincidences or even a feeling within us that something is meaningful. Jung described that as a numinous feeling or numinous experience where we feel something's particularly meaningful. So be open to it. Notice what you notice. Another expression that a friend of mine who I consider to be a mentor in this area, he taught me a lot about synchronicity, he, he, he describes this expression to file it away. You know, just file it away. It might be in the back of our mind. It might be obvious why that particular experience has happened or come into our mind or whatever. But in time, it might make itself known. We don't have to try and force some interpretation on it at the time. And if something's very important to us, if something's very important to our lives or destiny or whatever, it, I believe it'll tend to make itself known to us, especially if we're open to it. Sometimes it can also help to write it down. Mm -hmm. uh, if we record our experience, it helps us pay more attention to it. So just like when we write down our dreams, we record them when we wake up in the morning, we're more likely to dream and to remember our dreams in future. I think also, if people are interested in exploring this area further, to keep some diary or writing down uh, about a synchronistic event, some perhaps remarkable coincidence and maybe what it meant to us at the time, or if it didn't mean anything so much to us at the time, just even noting it and see if later on it seems meaningful. I think paying attention to something, appreciating something in that way helps enhance it. So they're the general things. Be open to it. Be open to what sense or meaning it might have for us. And it won't always be as obvious as what you described with your shift into um, interviewing radio rather than being a disc jockey. You know, in, in your case, you, you make it so clear um, uh, what it meant to you and that makes perfect sense. Sometimes things happen that don't make so much sense at the time. So I mentioned that example with the blackbird sacrificing itself for that fellow, he took that as very obvious at the time he was meant to live and he's reacted that way ever right. since. It's not always as clear as that. But just to be open to it and sometimes, for example, like for me, that 6th of June, uh, I realised afterwards being engaged at 6 o'clock on the 6th of June and also being hospitalised at 6 o'clock on the 6th of June, that was like heaven and hell on earth. I the imagine. best and worst <laughs> of human experience. It ties in also, and I thought, this is synchronistic. This is telling me that that's a theme in my life. It comes from the work of Carl Jung. Lo and behold, Carl Jung has died on the afternoon of 6th of June. That reinforces my sense that that's part of what my life work is on about, helping convey as a mainstream psychologist, helping get across information to other people. Look, you're not alone if you have synchronistic or other kind of spiritual or mystical experience. And I try and um, help convey that message also partly through having a website, uh, www.synchronicityunwrapped.com.au. And on that, I keep up updating different blogs and people's stories of their own synchronicity and all the rest of it. And on our mainstream uh, psychology practice website, Chris Mackey, M A C K E Y dot com dot AU, we have lots of information about uh, mainstream mental health and psychology and, and uh, uh, tips for helping deal with mental health problems. 
but also increasingly on our mainstream website I'm including more information about synchronicity as well and, and also looking to direct people to our Synchronicity Unwrapped website. So it's looking to get the information out there to, to encourage people to be open to what they experience and, uh, and certainly I look to have a number of um, uh, practical tips in the book uh, expanding on what I've mentioned here about ways of, of, of recognising and appreciating synchronicity and helping interpret its meaning, uh, 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 its personal meaning to the person. Well, very good, Chris. It's certainly been a wonderful pleasure to have you here on the program today. And again, they can discover more, as you said, your website, synchronicityunwrapped.com.au. Uh, wonderful website. Uh, the blog on there, you can discover a lot of interesting things on there. And I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today and sharing your book, Synchronicity. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. I'll mention one delightful thing that happened this morning when I was in the shower. Uh, it's been a 4 a.m. interview at my time, and I was up having a shower half, half an hour beforehand, and I looked across at the clock, and it was 3.33. I immediately <laughs> thought, oh, well, there we go. There's, there's, a, there's a triple trinity. There you go. That meant something to me, and it fortified me. I had that little shot of dopamine, and hopefully that helped me be um, wide awake through our interview. Thank you very much, Daniel. I've really enjoyed it. You betcha. Thank you again. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is our website with the number 50, and share your synchronistic experiences with us as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. You can follow us uh, on our Twitter page at Beyond 50 Radio as well as Facebook. Again, thank you for joining us. I'm Daniel Davis. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs> <laughs>